right, I'm uh, glad to be here with all you pretty cool people, as Maddie said. <laughs> all right, so I'm, I'm new to this, at least with you guys. I've, I've taught before, so um, uh, you'll, you'll have to coach me along. And I know since you're students, you'll probably lie to me anyway, so I'll, I'll take that with a grit. And I'm not just kidding, so. Anyway, just a little more about me. Um, I was raised in a Christian home, uh, came to know the Lord at nine years old, and it was a real definite uh, uh, moment in my life where um, I realized that Christ had died for me, given me eternal life, and I put my trust in him. Uh, shortly after that, I, I felt led to, to kind of commit my life to Whatever God wanted me to do, I thought it would be uh, teaching at a college level, but after going through college and seminary, I was tired of education and decided to go into the ministry. Pastor churches in New Mexico, Western New York, and Dallas area, and then came out here in 1998. And as I tell people, we're stuck here because all our grandkids are here. Um, started off at a church in Hanalei, Green Church there, got kicked out of that church. And then um, we started a, another congregation in Kilauea, and uh, we're uh, doing church up there for, what, 12 years or so when we joined with the uh, South Side to form one church with two campuses. I guess that's the best way to put it. So it's been a, quite a journey for all of us. As Rick said, I had an accident this past uh, May, uh, so kind of still recovering from that. but. Uh, God is good and, and uh, certainly is uh, continuing to heal in, in my life. So anyway, um, since I'm old, I'm not real tech savvy. I, even though I know there's, there's a screen and everything, um, I don't have stuff ready, so you'll have to excuse me. I've got all these papers for all of you. If you criticize me for cutting down trees, uh, that's all right. You can take one, pass it out. Um, as I tell everyone, uh, you can always plant a new tree. So if you think I use too much paper, you can, you can just uh, go out and plant a tree. All right, just to make sure you know this subject today is, uh, well, you could call it many different terms, but, but uh, I'm going to just call it systematic theology. And um, as I said, I've taught this other times. But um, has everybody got, got a packet? I was warned uh, last week by Keith, was it Keith Hamilton, who, uh, who spoke here last week, and he spoke on the North Shore. He said, uh, uh, this is a, a school with no homework. Is that correct? Mostly. No, no homework? He, he said, was, one of you complained to him that he assigned you some homework. And, and uh, so anyway, I've, I've got the warning, and, and you'll notice uh, the syllabus that is before you. Um, and the only reason I have this, because I've done this class before, so all I did was go back to some of my own papers and, and adjusted a few things, but it gives you a good outline. Uh, there's my name, my contact, either through email or phone. Uh, you can call me at any time. Doesn't mean I'll answer, but you can call me at any time. Uh, you could contact me through email anytime. If you just want to get away for a day, you can come up to the North Shore and we'll let you sleep in our house for a little bit. And you'll probably be there for two hours and leave because we got five kids running around and they're loud. So, um, but you're welcome to come on up anytime if you want to just take a break, um, see what's up there. So, Course description. This course is an introduction to Christian theology that will address the essential doctrines of traditional Christianity. Uh, emphasis will be on systematizing biblical teaching as it pertains to theological categories. The class will cover the definitions, primary teachings, and biblical references to the standard theological categories as they are listed here. We'll talk about those a little later. Now, I don't know what your backgrounds are. Uh, hopefully, as the more I teach, the more I'll get to know some of you. Um, so I don't know if, if you're new Christians, if you're longtime Christians, if you're longtime Christians that deconstructed your faith and reconstructed it and uh, have been going, going in one direction part of your life, now you're going in a different direction. 
Uh, so uh, we, we're going to have a lot of different um, uh, backgrounds. We're going to have a lot of different views of coming to this, to this course. Uh, some of you are probably already thinking, what does this have to do with anything I'm doing? And that's fine for you to think that. Uh, hopefully by the end of the course you at least will think, okay, so there's some value to this. Um, for others of you, you're going to feel like we don't go into it deep enough. Uh, in which case, during lunch you can come talk to me and we can go as deep as you want. So, um, but otherwise, um, it is more kind of a, a broad introduction to theology, to what Christians believe. And when I say Christian, I mean evangelical uh, Christian. The typical evangelical Christian. Now, I realize most of you are a lot younger than I am, so the word evangelical may not be the same to you as to me. What I mean by evangelical are those who believe that uh, Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. He is God. Through his death and resurrection, we have eternal life. An evangelical is concerned about sharing that with other people. An evangelical is somebody who believes that the Bible is the word of God. An evangelical is somebody who uh, basically comes out of the orthodox tradition of um, the church and going the way of the Reformation, so Protestant Christianity. We'll talk some more about that as we go on. Uh, a lot of what we talk about here, there's going to be uh, history involved uh, because, as you'll notice in this definition here, uh, the essential doctrines of traditional Christianity. So if you're a progressive Christian, uh, you're going to think, well, what about that? What about today? Or do we still hold on to those traditional thoughts? Well, that, that to me is a topic for another discussion. What I'm talking about is the traditional Christian views and doctrines that the church, for the most part, has believed through the ages. And obviously, we'll talk about different aspects. We're going to have differences of opinion, depending on the church background you come from, if you come out of a denomination, or maybe you actually came out of or are still Roman Catholic. If that's the case, there's going to be very uh, big differences of what we talk about. But this is a place where we can do that. Uh, I hope we don't end up in fistfights or things like that, but um, I, I think we can, we can handle those things. I want you to be free to ask questions anytime. I want you to feel free to challenge me. And if, I, uh, if you ask me a question and I begin to wither up here and say, oh, I don't know, well, that's tough. That's, <laughs> that's, I'm telling you the truth. And I may go and try to find an answer for you, but um, I don't have the answers to everything. And the answers I give, some of you are not going to like anyway. So uh, that's just how it is when you talk about doctrine, when you talk about uh, theology. Um, but that, to me, is what makes it so challenging. It's, it's, a, it's a topic that even though we have a, a standard from history, um, we see a lot of changes that have happened. And how we apply that uh, to our present age is always uh, a challenge. Okay, notice the course goal through the study of the systematic doctrines of the Bible. This course seeks to, one, deepen your personal knowledge of and faith in Jesus Christ. So the goal is not for you to just accumulate in your mind doctrinal truth, um, thoughts and ideas, definitions to words. Um, I hope that happens, uh, but I hope all of that leads to a growing uh, faith in your own life. Secondly, help you personally confirm and clarify the doctrinal foundations of the biblical worldview. Uh, maybe there are some areas that you've been hearing, okay, this is what Christians believe, but I'm not sure I believe that. Well, hopefully, after this course, there are certain areas you can say, well, I can explore this some more, I could study this some more, this, this confirms what I already believe. So I hope that happens in your life. And then third, enable to write your uh, own doctrinal statement. And since homework is optional, that's optional. But, but it would be great to, to, at least in your mind, have some sense of, of what you believe. So that when you go out into this world, when you look for a church, when you've moved to a new area, you have at least some kind of framework that you're looking at as to how you want to grow in your own faith. 
So here are the course requirements. Each student is required to attend and participate in all classes. Is that a requirement here? So. <laughs> And the rest, the rest are optional, basically. But if you want to do these things, so you could turn in three different essays. Um, I have some suggested topics here, but you could write on almost anything. Um, if there's something you want to explore yourself. Now, if you do write an essay, it, we're going to expect you to kind of just present it to the class a little bit. So um, maybe it's something you've been studying about. Maybe it's something you want to clarify in your own mind. Uh, then, then you could do that. So these are the, the optional essays you can write, uh, various topics, um, and then you can pick, uh, the, the essay number six is pick some theological subject and show what the Bible says about it. So it's, it's as broad as you can make it. Uh, so if you want to write an essay, uh, that'd be great. Uh, the third option is, as I mentioned before, that you compose your own personal doctrinal statement or creed. Our church's doctrinal statement is basically the Apostles' Creed. You can't get more simple than that. Many churches have elaborate doctrinal statements. Um, sometimes that's good, sometimes it's not good. Um, but we'll be talking about uh, the use of all those things. And the fourth thing, notice I did not put this as an option. This is uh, make a creative project uh, to be done in the last day of class. And you could do this with a team, and I'll be next time, or not next time, because next time is, is a couple of hours from now, but next week when I come back, I'll give you a list of things you could do. For instance, you can create a uh, Sunday school lesson for uh, second grade boys on teaching the Trinity. You can uh, write a song uh, that, that has some theological content in it. You can write a poem. Uh, you can... Um, make a creative essay. You could do a uh, creative dance. Whatever you want to do. Something creative that, uh, in a sense, makes you think about a theological topic and think of a way to, to speak of that topic or to present that topic in a creative way. Uh, so I'll, I'll be giving you some options uh, next week. So this is a basic outline. Um, I, I'm assuming that I will be here most Fridays, and if I'm here most Fridays, at least till the end of the semester, this is the schedule we'll have. If that doesn't happen, then we'll just uh, do whatever happens, okay? You'll notice um, I'll be teaching, when I'm here on Fridays, I'll be here for three sessions, two in the morning, one in the afternoon. You'll notice on the afternoon session for many of the days, I've called it catch-up and Q&A because usually when we talk about theology, there's a lot of questions, a lot of interaction, so we get off track. And so I'm, I'm leaving room to catch up, but this is also a time where you could bring your questions and answers, not or questions, and, not, and we'll answer them, or I guess you can answer them too. But, um, so if you want, you can write those questions down. That way I could maybe do a little research on them. Um, or just, you know, as, as we go through some of these topics, you'll probably naturally just have some questions. So that's kind of an outline of, of where we're going in this course. Um, and since we have three sessions a day, uh, we can still cover quite a bit, even though we're, we're done by December 9th. Okay, any questions on, on just the syllabus, the direction we're going in this class? Go ahead. So do you, just not, do you want us to wait till that afternoon session to ask questions? Or just ask no, you can, you can ask questions during, during the session. You can, you can raise your hand or jump up or shout or <laughs> however you need to draw my attention. Um, because, you know, obviously when you're going through something, you may think of something, you may have a question, if you wait till you know another time, you may either forget it or you kind of think, ah, oh, it's not that useful. So I, I want to know if you're if you have a question right away. And so I'll I'll be pausing different times during um, our class period uh, at, to just ask if you have any questions. And um, you know I've I've got some things where you'll be discussing. We'll be discussing as a group. So it's not just just lecture. We'll be doing. Although I do love to lecture, so no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, so 
When we think of systematic theology, here's, here's the beginning question to discuss. What is the essence of Christianity? What, what, if someone were to ask you, tell me in one sentence, what is Christianity? Or even one word, what would you say? The only way to be saved. Okay, so you would say that the essence of Christianity is the gospel. Okay. Anybody else? Go ahead. Okay, eternal life, that would be the gospel too. Unfailing love, okay, that's a little broader. Okay, relationships, okay, so now we're, we're so far the, the first three ones basically dealt with theology. Whether you meant it or not, it was what, what we believe, what is important in, in, in a sense in our minds. But when you bring up relationships, something else has come into the picture, right? Okay, what else, what else might you think of as far as the essence of Christianity? People who worship God. What's that? People who worship God. Okay, people who worship God. That's, that's a broad... See, when you, when you ask a question like this, it can be very broad. And sometimes the broader it is, the, the better it is. But if it gets too broad, then it can become meaningless. Uh, because, you know, sometimes what, if, if you say, well, it's, it's Christianity is believing in God. Well, that includes a lot of different other religions, too. See, so, so you're right. It, it can be something real broad, but, but sometimes we do need to narrow it down some more. Okay, here's, here's a, a second part of this question. I'm going to give you multiple choice. Is the essence of Christianity belief? What we believe, that's A. B is the essence of Christianity, our experience, meaning our spirituality, our relationship to God. Or C, is it practice, how we behave in this world? Okay, so who wants to go with A? You're not supposed to say that yet. You're ruining my, no, no. Okay, she's absolutely right. It, it includes all three. And, and you can't say one is over the other, even though some of you in your mind, that's what you're thinking. You can go to scripture and you can find many verses that talk about a Christian believes certain things. In the first epistle of John, it talks about that a believer is somebody who believes that Jesus came in the flesh. And if you don't believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, you can't be a Christian. So right there is a, an item of belief. And all through scripture, we have different things that say this is what a child of God is going to believe. This is what a Christian believes. But there's also a lot in scripture that talks about how we are to behave, right? And in fact, some people who, unlike maybe the majority of us, as I'm hearing you talk, and of course the church that I'm in and the church I've come out of and the Christianity that I grew up with, the emphasis is on the gospel for somebody to come to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And usually that's put in the form of Jesus Christ died for your sins. He rose again so that you might have eternal life. If, if you put your faith in him, you are saved. And that's absolutely true. What did the Philippian jailer say to, uh, to Paul and Silas when they were in jail in Acts chapter 16 when the earthquake came and the, and the doors opened up and the jailer was afraid? What did he say? What did he ask Paul? What must I do to be saved? And remember what Paul said? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be, you shall be saved. So, that verse tells us this is what it means to be saved. Does that verse tell us what it means to be a Christian? Is being a Christian different than being saved? Well, yes and no. 
A technical definition of a Christian is somebody who is saved. But the reality is you can have a lot of people who are saved that are not, for instance, in a Christian church or even understand Christian doctrine. But they've come to a place where they've accepted Jesus as their Savior and Lord. And so there's a lot of people who do not put the emphasis so much on the gospel itself as much as how do we live. They might even say something like this. Well, you know, I'm not that concerned about, I'm not that concerned about what, what somebody believes as much as I'm concerned about how they behave. And if you look at the gospels, for instance, you'll see many sections that talk about that. It talks about how a person lives. And that's why there's many people who believe that the Bible teaches that we are judged by our works. Okay? And when we do get to heaven, there are passages that talk about that our works will be examined. But we'll talk about that later when we get to salvation. The point I'm making is with Christianity, it's really all three of those things. Right belief, which is orthodoxy. Right spirituality, which is your relationship to God. You could say orthopathy. And then orthopraxy. That's right behavior. That's what we do as a Christian. How many times have... Maybe somebody said to you, or you've read, or even you've thought, somebody who is a public figure, and they've publicly said, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus as my Savior and Lord, but they do the most atrocious things in life. How do you react to that? Do you say, or think, that guy's not really a Christian? Or, you may be a little more sympathetic, and you say, what a poor example of Christianity, and I wish he'd shut up. You see, the whole point is we all have this understanding that Christianity is not just right belief. You have to have right belief. It's not just having the right relationship with God. In other words, how, how many times have, have you heard the expression, you know, Christianity is, is not, it's, it's a relationship, not, not a, what, what, how do they use it? It's not a religion, yes. Yeah, not a religion, it's a relationship. And so if, if you were to say, well, what do you mean by that? Probably you'd say something like, well, you, you have a relationship to God. You know God personally. And that's important for Christians to realize. And then, of course, doing the right thing. So that if, if you say, I'm a Christian, I've had this uh, spiritual experience with God, but if you're going out there and just breaking all the laws that God has given to mankind, I think people can rightfully say, I'm not sure that person really is a Christian. So when we talk about theology, we're talking mainly about right belief. We're talking about orthodoxy. We're talking about the doctrines that we have. So that's what we'll be looking at. We're going to be looking at... And many times I'll be talking about this is the correct doctrine, and you may bristle at that at first, but what I mean by that is that's been the orthodox Christian view of that belief or that doctrine. And sometimes they change, but most of the Christianity we have and the beliefs we have are meant to last forever. If you have a Bible, you might want to look at Jude... And Jude only has one chapter, so verse 3. He says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. So Jude is writing to these believers who are being overwhelmed by false teachers. And he says, I'm writing these things to you so that you will contend for the faith. 
Now, if you're contending for the faith, you're, there's something you're contending for. In other words, you're, you're defending something. You're upholding something. And it says right here, for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. So when it talks about faith here, it's not talking about your personal belief. It's talking about a, a, a body of faith, a, a doctrinal issue that has been passed down from the apostles. And so that's what we're going to be looking at as we study theology today. So any comments, any questions? Okay, go ahead. If you were living like you were a Christian, mm -hmm. Um, okay, we'll be talking about that when we get, get to salvation, but just quick answer. My belief is that if you're truly a Christian, you're always one. You, can't, you don't lose your, your faith, but you can lose your, your connection to God in a sense, your relationship to him. And so repentance brings that all back. You're right. So now if, you, if you're one who believes, okay, if I sin too much, if I'm stubbornly sinning against God, I could lose my salvation, then repentance would bring you back into salvation, if, if you so. So that is a way of doing. The, the, the Bible talks a lot about repentance. Repentance is not something you just do in order to enter Christianity. Repentance is the kind of life you live forever from the point you believe in Jesus Christ. And the reason you have to repent is because you keep sinning. And we're going to be talking about that when we talk about mankind, when we talk about sin. These are all theological issues that we're going to be looking at. Okay, any other questions so far? Go ahead. Uh, just to clarify, so you said that you could be a Christian, or you could be saved without being a Christian. Mm -hmm. but, well, well, technically. Technically. It's, it's a trick thing, trick also, question. Yeah, go ahead. No. See, I, I think being saved is something that God does in a person's life. He does that when we put our faith and trust in him. So it's an act of God that he does. But being a Christian has a lot of things. For instance, uh, just recently, uh, Ligonier Ministries and Barna uh, Studies did a, this big survey of, of what, what Americans believe. And then they extended it to other countries what Americans believe about certain aspects of Christianity. And, and then they, they also uh, did this survey to people who call themselves evangelical Christians. And it's amazing how many evangelical Christians believe that Jesus was created. Any of you believe that Jesus was created? Don't raise, I mean, you probably aren't going to raise your hand after I just said that. But you might think, well, wait, wait, wait a second. He was born in Bethlehem. So didn't he get a start there? You see, so we're going to be talking about that. Are these, I'm, I'm kind of whetting your appetite here. But it was amazing how many Christians, evangelical Christians, who go to church, when they were asked the question, was Jesus created? Is he a created being? <coughs> How many said yes? Now here's one that some of you may, may go on the side where this survey felt that, that Christians should not be. And that was a question like this. Can you worship God and follow Jesus Christ and never go to church and never be a part of a church? And there was a large percentage that said yes. No. Some of you are going, well, I better not show my expression. I believe that. Okay, good point. Or, as I said, that's when you start making the distinction. That person may be saved, but they're not a Christian. Being saved is something that's eternal. Being a Christian is something that you live out in this world. So it's a, it's a matter of definition. Now, like I said... Technically, I think someone who's saved is, is automatically a Christian. 
but being a Christian, in a sense, is how you live out your salvation. And when we, we get to the place where we talk about salvation, we're going to talk a lot about what does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to have eternal life? And, and if we really believe that salvation is by grace, through faith, by Christ alone, anybody know what Sunday is coming up? Let's see if you know your church history. See, the, the Sunday right around Halloween, it's a special Sunday for Christians. It's Reformation, it's what's called Reformation Sunday. Anybody know why it might be called Reformation Sunday? What happened historically? They What's that? They needed a reform. They needed a reform. Well, who was that reformer? Okay, what did he do? 95 theses. 95 theses he posted on the church door. A, a list of, of 95 grievances against the church at that time. That he said, we've gone away from the Bible, and it's time to get back. And that is how the Protestant movement began. So, is anyone here Catholic or consider yourself Catholic? Any of you grow up in the Catholic Church? Okay, so, so none of you are even near there. Any of you Orthodox? Some of you are going, what is that? Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, or since there's now the, the war between Russia and Ukraine, the Ukraine Orthodox Church is broken away from the Russian Orthodox Church. So, so none of you are Orthodox. So that tells me if you have a label for yourself, it's going to be you're a Protestant. Have you ever been told that? Anybody ever said to you, you're a Protestant? Probably not. But if you know anything about church history, you are a Protestant. If you're not Catholic, if you're not Orthodox, but you still consider yourself a Christian, you follow Jesus Christ, more than likely you're Protestant. Unless you've joined some kind of cult or sect. We'll deal with that later. No. <laughs> so we're Protestants, and the Protestants had the Reformation and what they call the five solas. Faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, all to the glory of God. And I left out one. So anyway, all right. Look at your next uh, handout. It's titled, You Might Just Might Be a Theologian If. For some of you who are thinking, okay, this is stuff I don't really care to know. I'm never going to be a theologian. Well, you'll, you might be surprised. You just might be a theologian if you worship God. Because if you worship God, you have some understanding in your mind of the God you worship, hopefully. And if you worship God through singing, hopefully the songs you're singing, you can at least say, wait a second, I don't think that's biblical. Have you ever done that with a song? Ever been singing something or been at a different church and they're singing some song and you're listening to the words and you're going, wait a second. <laughs> when I first came out of seminary, um, that, that, that's what I, and that was back in the days before there were, there were even a lot of praise and worship songs. So there were old hymns. And of course, a lot of those hymns were written in the 1800s and in bar rooms and stuff like that. And I, I remember one Sunday just, just um, kind of critiquing all the, all the hymns. <laughs> My wife said, well, that was a stupid thing to do. He just ruined everybody's Christianity, their spirituality. They're probably thinking, well, I can't sing that anymore. Well, we, we often sing heresy, okay? You know what heresy is? Heresy is when you go against the truths of Christianity. In the old days, a heretic could be burned at the stake. We don't do that anymore. Now, if you're accused of heresy, you just go to another church. That's what happens, so. Okay, so if you worship God, you are a theologian. You might just be a theologian if you love God. Now, anybody here married? No. So you, oh, you can't. Oh, you can't. You can't be married to be a student here. Oh. No. All right. Well, when I got married, I, of course, married Patricia Wilson was her name, her maiden name, and I married her because we spent a lot of time together. I got to know her. I really liked what I saw. 
And when I decided to marry her, I thought, you know, I think I know her pretty well. Now, for me to love my wife, does that mean after I get married, I quit getting to know her? Have I, have I reached the limits of knowing everything about her? No. And maybe that's why some marriages break up, because they think they do. And how many times have you heard maybe somebody say, well, she's not the, the wife I married, or he's not the husband I married? Yeah. Well, it could be because you didn't see it. And it, maybe you should say, you know, I didn't know him that well. And now you need to make a decision. Do I get to know him more? Do I get to know her more? So if you want to know God, love God, you're going to be a theologian. You're, want to, you're going to want to find out more about this God you love. Just like a spouse wants to find out more about and spend time with the person they love. Okay, you might be a theologian if you talk about God. You might be a theologian if you pray. You might be a theologian if you get upset when people say wrong things about God, Christ, or Christianity. Has that ever happened to you? Yep. Okay, there's not, sometimes there's not much you can do about it. Other times you complain to your friends and they kind of say, okay, that's enough. But, but yeah, it should bother you if you hear things that are being said, especially by other Christians or people who say they're Christian, that go against the Bible or what you believe about Jesus. You might be a th theologian for uh, number six. You sense there's a difference between the religions of the world. You've probably heard the expression, well, all religions, don't they lead to God? And the picture of, you know, we're all in this sea and there's all these boats and they're all going to God. As somebody said, well, you still have to get into a boat. In other words, you have to choose which boat to get into. And when you choose one boat and you begin to study it more, you find religions are not the same. They're very different. And so what makes them different? So that's theology. And then seven, this is when I was doing something for what we called our one day Bible school. You're attending Anchor House. You just might be a theologian, okay? So what are we talking about on the back page? Theology. Theology is a word made up of two Latin terms, theo, which means God, ology, which means study or science of. Theology is simply the study of God. Systematic theology takes a huge topic, breaks it down into digestible pieces, provides a concise summary of what the Bible says about a particular subject. So systematic theology, hopefully you've read all of scripture and you've read all the verses that talk about grace, for instance. And now you can say, this is what the Bible says about grace. That's your theology of grace. Or if you want to be a little more concise, you can take just the, the letter of Paul to the Romans and say, this is what Romans says about grace. That would be called biblical theology, where you take a subject from one of the books of the Bible and elaborate on what, the, what that book says. But systematic theology, as the word systematic means, it brings all these things together. Doctrine is just another term for sound biblical teaching. In Acts chapter two, it says that the early church met and they met and they, they listened to and obeyed the apostles' doctrine. So doctrine is sound biblical teaching. Dogma. Dogma is something that a group or organization puts down as a truth that they want their people to listen to. So it's a little different than doctrine. Dogma is more something that a group has said, this is what we're going to believe. Now, obviously, sometimes dogma is the same as doctrine. And then third is creed or confession. A creed or confession is, um, is where you put together what you believed. In your packet, is there a, uh, the Apostles' Creed? Did I give that to you or do I still need to hand that out? In the packet, okay. Well, I'll do that next session, but we'll, we'll look at some of the most simple creeds. Um, 
Okay, let's, let's do this next session, section and then we'll, uh, we'll break. So Roman numeral two, why uh, are so many put off by theology? Any of you put off by theology? He's not going to admit that. Oh, you are? <laughs> okay, here's some reasons. The conclusions are too neat to be true. And every one of these has a little truth to them. See, I, I can start teaching you a doctrine, and you can go, wow, I never thought of that, and wow, that's interesting. Oh, that must be right. Well, that's because I, I made it to, for you to, to agree with me, in a sense. Now, if you're, you're a good, good arguer, debater, uh, you might say, wait a second, your argument has a hole in it. See? And that's what theology does. That's why some people, in fact, I think it's down here somewhere, some people think of theology as, as monks gathered around trying to decide how many angels can fit on the head of a pin. Have you ever heard that expression? See, see, there's, there's a generation gap between me and all of you. That's, that's an expression that was often told about how, how theology is so, so out there that all it is is like, like monks getting together and trying to argue how many angels can fit on a pin. And you go, why would they even argue about that? Because the argument is, are angels, do they have a body or do they not? If they don't have a body, then infinitesimal amounts of, peop of angels could be on the head of a pin. But if they have a body, then you're limited to how many angels can be on the head of a pin. Now, some of you are saying, what in the world is this? Well, that's what some people think theology is. And sometimes you're going to feel that way. Some of these topics are, are just not things you're thinking about right now. And that's okay. Hopefully there'll be some that you are. Um, B, choice of topic dictates the conclusion. I kind of mentioned that. C, don't talk to me about theology. Talk to me about something practical. I'm interested in action, in what works. I don't need to know more about God. I need to know God better. Absolutely true. But I want to say I think you'll know God better when you have an understanding of what the Bible says about God. Just like I know my wife better when I know about her. Okay? D, theology is that silly and useless practice of arguing, uh, such as things that this one I told you before, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Could God create a stone so heavy that he couldn't lift it? Have you heard that one? Could he plant an immovable post in the ground and then throw an unstoppable rock at it? <laughs> All right. E, this is the one that I think a lot of people, theology divides, whereas love unites. That's a takeoff of a passage in one of Paul's letters where it says knowledge divides, but love unites. Knowledge in the sense of it makes you pride, prideful. And that can happen when you study theology. You can study it and say, whoa, boy, do I know a lot. And um, so, F, one cannot mix theology with soul winning. That's not true. G, theology is dull and impractical. It's what it feels like sometimes, but it's not always. Theology is over the heads of most people. There probably is some truth to that now because we don't talk about it that much. Uh, why learn a lot of theology when we do not live up to the light we already have? That's a good principle, but you can also say that, why should I read my Bible anymore since I'm not even obeying what I've already read? Is that a reason to stop reading your Bible? No. Well, I, I don't need to go to church anymore. I know all the songs we sing. See? It would be the same kind of thing. Uh, the key goal is to let the Bible master us and not spend our energies in mastering the Bible. Again, I, I don't think that's true. Theologians are pompous, divisive, arrogant, legalistic, and some are. But again, that's not a reason not to study theology. Okay, our time is up. I've gone actually a little past. So we'll see you at, what is it, 11 o'clock? <laughs>